morning. Let us begin with prayer. Holy and gracious God, we rest for a minute on a day that was never promised to us in a year when we didn't know what we could count on from one moment to the next. And yet here we are, having learned so much having survived what a year ago would have seemed like the stuff of science fiction, and yet today has become simply part of life. We are grateful for all that has sustained us, for friends who have figured out ways to be together in spite of distance and so many rules, for families who even through grief have reminded us of how precious each one is, for teachers and coaches who have encouraged and guided, for a world and a country that has seemed so precarious and yet has held together. And in spite of it all, we know we are blessed by this lovely planet where we make our home, 
by this school that has been a place of welcome and challenge, by families who have done all they could to get us to this place, by circumstance and intelligence, and by the mystery of having survived all the times it could have gone so badly wrong. So as we gather, make us mindful of all these gifts and spur in us the commitment to use those blessings that all peoples of all the earth might have similar good possibilities, that those who come after us and who walk beside us might also sing and laugh and look to the future with hope. We pray in your many names. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today to celebrate the graduating class of 2021. While I'm not a member of this class, I have had the opportunity to watch them grow the past three years. During this incredibly hard year, the class of 21 has persevered and made a positive impact on us all, including myself. From my time as a freshman till now, this graduating class has continued to shake things up. Always questioning the status quo and never taking no for an answer, this amazing group of seniors has taken Maryville College by storm and has left big shoes for the rest of us to fill. While I'm sure this is not how any of you pictured your senior year would go, you know, with the worldwide pandemic and all, you have continued to be a shining light in such a dark time. And on behalf of the rest of the student body, I want to say thank you. Thank you for always being there to lighten us up with your humor, to push us to work harder, to constantly be front runners of change, and for always trying to do good on the largest possible scale. While I could stand up here and recite all the ways that each and every one of you embodies the ideals that Isaac Anderson stood for, I'd rather take the time to talk about one of the greats that we really know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In her time on the Supreme Court, she was a lot like each of you, being described as driven, hardworking, powerful, and ready for change to come. As stated by RBG herself, Real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time. You guys were that first step. You took the chances classes before you were too scared to take. You made your voices loud and proud and brought others along that road with you. You have changed Maryville College as we know it, and you have changed it for the better. This being said, don't stop now. Keep inspiring others with your words, your tweets, and your actions. <laughs> Keep being the people who won't take no for an answer, Keep being the people who push for change. Keep holding each other and others accountable. Most importantly, keep being the fighting Scots that we have all known you to be. Congratulations, you guys. The work you have done here has only just begun. The poetry reading for today comes from Joy Harjo. Remember, Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the stars' stories. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is, the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are the earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them, they are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe, and this universe is you. Remember all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Beautiful job, um, everyone. Good morning. It has been the past practice when possible to invite someone with ties to the college to deliver our baccalaureate message. 
This year's speaker follows that tradition a little more closely than some others. Though he is not an alumnus himself, he has had an influence on many of the graduates who will be crossing the stage this very afternoon. In fact, it was a group of seniors helping in the planning of this baccalaureate program who asked that he be this year's baccalaureate speaker. Dr. Drew Crane is the professor of biology here at Maryville College. He earned a BA in biology from Clemson University, an MS in zoology, and a PhD in zoology from the University of Florida. Uh, we don't hold that against you, though. He began his association with Maryville College in 1998 as an assistant professor. He is passionate about his undergraduate students, has been honored as Maryville College Teacher of the Year, is chair of the Maryville College Woods Group, and can often be found teaching in leading heights in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Dr. Crane's main area of research is, fo is focused on environmental health, but recently his scholarly activities have turned to the compatibility of science and Christianity. He is active in his local church, where he has served as elder, pastoral council member, and Bible study teacher. He is also a published author, assisting in the writing production and distribution of the Little River Watershed Blue Ways map, and he has a knack, apparently, for canning grape jelly. Drew is a strong advocate for all our students and serves as a mentor, leader, confidant, and role model on this campus. It is my true pleasure to welcome Dr. Drew Crane as our 2021 baccalaureate speaker. As noted in the program, he has titled his sermon, Slow Down and Love Others More Deeply. Everyone, Dr. Drew Crane. Thank you, President Coker and class of 2021 for the invitation to deliver this year's baccalaureate address. Know that I'm humbled. Uh, and, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there, especially my mother who got, came from South Carolina to see this today. So first, a few movie quotes. Speed. I am speed. One winner, 42 losers. I ate losers for breakfast. <laughs> Anybody recognize that quote? Cars. Eh, that's Lightning McQueen, yes. Second movie quote. I feel the need, the need for speed. Again, a quote, a little bit further back, Top Gun. That's uh, Goose and Maverick from Top Gun. Today, I'm going to speak of the need for speed, or rather, the lessons that we have learned over the past year about the perceived need for speed. To say this past academic year has been tough is a gross understatement. We all know that. We've lost beloved professor Gina Benedict. We lost student and celebrated veteran Matt Malone. In addition, many of us have lost someone very close to us. And we have all lost face-to-face -face interaction with so many people. These tragic losses are heavy indeed, but as a Christian, I'm convinced that for every rough patch that we go through, we should learn something from it and use the struggles to better each other, to better our local and global community. I pray that today I can give a bit of encouragement and hope. Let's go back to the perceived need for speed. For the past seven or eight decades, our society has thrived on speed. Technology, which is really just the application of my discipline in the natural sciences, has increased exponentially in my lifetime. For instance, the computational capacity in one of your iPhones is greater than NASA had when they sent Apollo 11 to the moon. Let me repeat that. <laughs> the computational capacity in your iPhone is greater than NASA had when they sent Apollo 11 to the moon. But as poet and novelist Wendell Berry has said, perhaps we need to repent of the speedy technology gains that have led us to more harm than good. 
Now, as a professor of biology, you might think at this point I would turn to scientific studies that have shown the plight of technological advances. <laughs> but if I'm to be honest with you, I must admit that I've learned a lot more about life from my friends and family than from books, journal articles, or Google. For instance, consider a lesson I learned from my colleague and friend, Kim Trevathan. 20 years ago, when Kim was 40, he traveled the entire distance of the Tennessee River in a canoe with his dog. And he wrote a book about it, and it was a good book. But 20 years later, when Kim turned 60, he decided to take his dog on a canoe trip up the Tennessee River, literally paddling upstream for 652 miles. I think of myself as a very passionate and adventurous guy, but paddling upstream through four states, that seems pretty crazy. <laughs> but Kim's new book reveals stories of a slower trip going upstream. During his slower trip, he discovered many, many more things than he did going downstream. Indeed, his trip revealed that slowing down, noticing things closely, and appreciating those with whom we in contact are vital virtues. Trevathan took his trip three years ago, and his book was released during the pandemic. But because of the pandemic, we have learned the same lesson. Slowing down can bring good, because slowing down causes us to recognize, reflect, and truly connect with those around us. We need true interconnectedness, and slowing down can bring that. Using a Greek word, we need philia. Just to reinforce this idea that slowing down is good, I want to do a little responsive game with you. I'm going to say a word or phrase, and you either give a positive yay or a negative groan through your masks. Okay, so I'm going to say this is one of those psychology tests where you see if a word has a positive or negative connotation. So, yay if good, boo if bad. First word, massage. Mm, think of a slow, relaxing massage. Not one of those, uh, done, you know, okay. So. The second phrase, Easter sunrise. Yay. Yay, as we all know, sunrise happens slowly. And they are so beautiful, if you appreciate them. The third word, zoom. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> You see, the need for speed is not always virtuous. <laughs> Jesus taught the need to slow down and focus on others so clearly. What I'd like to do is take you back to a night 2,000 years ago, a night in Jerusalem in a large upper room. This was a night where Christ was sharing an evening with his best friends, the apostles. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell two things about this evening. First, they describe the Lord's Supper, where Jesus changed the traditional Jewish elements of unleavened bread and wine to refer to his own body and blood. We know this story well. It's the story of the Lord's Supper. Second, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell of Jesus calling out Judas for being a traitor. But in John's Gospel, the story of this night is delivered very differently. And that's what I'd like to focus on. The Gospel of John is certainly different from the other synoptic Gospels. In Christian iconography, John is depicted as the eagle, the one that sees things clearly from above. Indeed, in the book of John, we see a story of Jesus not focused on events or chronology, but on why Jesus was on earth. John certainly gives us an eagle's eye view. So on this night I mentioned, in this upper room, John doesn't even mention the Lord's Supper. How odd is that? Yet he tells a totally different event, an event so mundane it's silly to even discuss, except that John does, and that's heavy. Let me read of this event from the Message Translation by Eugene Peterson. This is John 13, 1 through 17. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew the time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, firmly in his grasp, all set for betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he had came from God and was on the way back to God. 
So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, and put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. When he got to Simon Peter, Peter said, Master, you wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You don't understand what I'm doing, but it'll be clear enough to you later. Peter persisted, You are not going to wash my feet, ever. And Jesus said, If I don't wash you, you can't be part of what I'm doing. Master, said Peter, not only my feet then, wash my hands, wash my head. And Jesus said, If you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet to be washed now, and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. So now you're clean, but not every one of you. He knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said not every one of you. After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on, and went back to his place at the table. Then he said, do you understand what I've done for you? You address me as teacher and master, and rightly so. That's what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, wash your feet, you must now wash each, wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant doesn't, isn't ranked above his master, and employees doesn't give orders to his employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. I think there are three key lessons, I'm Baptist by the way, uh, that we can learn from this scripture. First, Jesus shows us that slowing down is healthy. Second, Jesus cared deeply for his friends. And third, Jesus cares deeply for us. First, we need to recognize that we need to slow down. Jesus took time to gather with his close friends. Think about it. He was never in a great hurry. Jesus ate and sat around campfires with his friends, both before and after his death and resurrection. And I don't think this is because of the time in which he lived. I think it's because he was illustrating a trait of someone that has a flourishing life. Indeed, we need to shed the need for speed. But that's certainly easier said than done. What could that look like for you graduates? Well, how about this summer, instead of getting in a car and speeding to the grocery store and fighting the traffic, call up some friends and ask that they would like to walk with you to a farmer's market near where you're living. You'd be surprised how many farmer's markets are available, even in large metropolitan areas. What's the benefit of this slowdown activity? Well, you get to walk outdoors, talk to your friends, and you get healthy food. Here's another slowdown idea. Next year, whatever you'll be doing, make sure you intentionally take some time every day, maybe a lunch break, maybe a late afternoon activity, to walk and talk with family, friends, or colleagues. I've noticed our own chaplain, Ann McKee, has taken to this practice this year. <laughs> she walks around campus, talks to people either in person or on the phone, and smiles and laughs the whole time. This past year, I've had many walks in the woods meetings, almost as many walk in the woods meetings as I've had Zoom meetings, and that says a lot. Yeah, got it. Why? Well, I can talk face to face outdoors safely. Walking meetings are slower, more relaxing, and more healthy. This walk and talk practice can be done in the heart of Memphis, Knoxville, Atlanta, Madisonville, or Maryville. <laughs> so the first lesson is slow down. The second lesson we learn from the scripture is that Jesus cared deeply for his friends. He would do anything for them, including washing their feet as a house servant would normally do. Jesus served his friends in the humblest of manners. Think of your friends right now. Those that have held you over the last year, mostly metaphorically because of COVID. Cherish them. You will stay connected to some of your college students friends, and some you will not. You now enter a season of your life when you will connect with new friends, and I encourage you to be intentional about establishing those relationships. After I graduated from college, I continued my education in graduate school. As President Coker mentioned, I went to the University of Florida, and that certainly brought a new friend group, being that I was a zoology student. 
I had a bunch of geeky, zoology-based friends. And I knew I also needed to have some normal friends. <laughs> so, as a Christian, I joined a church. And after my wife and I got married, we invested our slow time with the friends we made at our church. And they are still deep, cherished friends. I mentioned the Greek word philia earlier. This is the word of true love between friends. It's the word used in John 15 when Jesus said to the apostles, My command is this, love each other as I've loved you. You are my friends. <laughs> so the second lesson we learn from the washing of the feet scripture is that Jesus cared deeply for his friends. And he gives us an example of how to serve them and serve others. I think the third lesson we can glean from John's account of the upper room is that Christ cares deeply for us. You see, he wasn't just speaking and giving an example to the disciples. He was speaking and giving an example to us. Jesus is saying to us today the same thing that John records him saying to the apostles. And again, I'll quote from the scripture I read. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. Jesus' love for us is shown clearly in what he did just after the foot washing event. He went out and prayed for us. The Gospel of John records him praying this, the goal for all of them, he was speaking about us in the future, the goal for all of them is to become one heart and one mind then they will mature in this oneness. Class of 2021, God loves you, and he wants you to continue to mature in oneness. There's so much truth in this. Indeed, why is a biology professor delivering a sermon today? A question I've been asked a few times. Well, because I believe in truth. The truth found in the scientific method and the truth found through God. I believe that God's truth is for all of humanity, and I yearn to mature in oneness with God and oneness with others. This truth leads me to see that society today has so many needs, and we have so many yearnings. We yearn for equality of all people. And class of 2021, because I know you, I know you will help us bring us closer to that reality. We yearn to promote environmental health because doing so helps other people. And I know you will bring us closer to that reality. We yearn to eliminate the suffering of those around us. And because I know you, I know you will help bring us closer to that reality. The only way that we will approach oneness is for us to all stand up in our society and be a positive example. And as Tyler Perry said at the Academy Awards a few weeks ago, we need to stand in the middle. We must reduce the polarization in our society. We must achieve oneness. My prayer for you, class of 2021, is that you will slow down, seek and help others, and be blessed through your relationship with God. Finally, know that I and my colleagues are so proud of you. I began with a few movie quotes, but I leave you, class of 2021, with one word. Godspeed. Thank you. What a beautiful sermon by Dr. Crane. I didn't see that. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and good morning, soon to be graduates. Sometimes we forget what the Lord has accomplished in our lives and focus more on what we do not yet have but want. 
Now, this service is the perfect intimate opportunity for all of us to pause and reflect and also give thanks to the Lord for the journey we have traveled at Maryville College. Please join me in prayer. Loving and merciful God of the universe, we stand before you exhausted and wondering what the unknown future will bring. We trust that you are right beside us. As we begin a new chapter of our lives, we turn to you for guidance, wisdom, and strength. These last four years have been filled with joy, challenges, and accomplishments. One of the unique things that the class of 2021 will always remember is having experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result of that, we live through hybrid classes, online classes, temperature checks, and lessen social times. You've given us, Lord, the gift of perseverance, hard work, and intellect. And for this, our hearts are forever grateful. We know we don't do things alone, but all good things come from you, O Lord. We are also thankful for the graces of flexibility and creative collaboration and that we're able to be stretched beyond what we thought our capabilities were. We trust that these will give us fortified spirits as we courageously turn to the next chapters of our lives. We acknowledge these things, remembering the way you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I ask this of everyone in the building. I want you all to look at each other, whoever is sitting next to you. Look at them with eyes of joy <laughs> and compassion. And remember what St. Augustine said. If you want to see God, you have the means to do it. For God is love and God is peace. May God bless you all. Thank you. What riches we have. I do feel obligated to say that Dr. Drew Train tried to weasel out of this thing by saying he would not be the best speaker we could find. Just wrong. I mean, just wrong. <laughs> The word benediction means blessing, which flows so deeply. So a few more words. Friends, the writer of the letter of John said, perfect love casts out fear. But even imperfect love can do quite a lot. So go out with your less than perfect wisdom and offer yourself to a world that is confused. Go out with your less than perfect judgment and figure out the next step to take. Go out with your less than perfect energy and give what you have to a world in need. Go out with your less than perfect courage and know that love will bear you up. You don't have to be complete or whole or perfect. You only need to be generous and bold and kind. And may the one who is perfect in love 
in wisdom, in judgment, in courage. May that one hold you up, grant you what you need, and bring you joy now and in the days to come. Amen.